earlier this week, somebody told me about a funeral of a homeless man, and they asked me would I go and play harmonica at, at the funeral. They were just going to have a graveside, and they said, could you play Amazing Grace? And I said, sure. And uh, they told me where it was at. I thought I knew where it was at. I wasn't sure. And uh, so I was planning on trying to get there early so I could find the place, but I got caught up here at work, and uh, then when I left, I got caught up in all the Bojangles traffic on the street. Have y'all seen that? It's like, what the world? And I'm like 10 minutes there at the Bojangles traffic, so then I pull out, and then I hit the Popeye's traffic. <laughs> and so I go across town, and by the time I get there, I'm running 15, 20 minutes late, and I look up at the place I, I said, this is it. I've missed it. <laughs> and they had already finished the graveside service, apparently. And there was just two grave digger fellas there was finishing up. And, uh, and I felt horrible, you know. I was, but I said, you know, the guy, you know, he deserves a song at his funeral. So I, I got out anyway and brought my harmonica over there. And I said to the two grave diggers, they had just obviously put the vault on. And I said, guys, do you mind? And I just began to play Amazing Grace on the harmonica in honor of this man. I didn't even knowing and I was just playing with all of my heart and and halfway through I looked over and one of the guys was standing with their shovels and just tears was coming out their eyes and man it just teared me up and I was crying and they were crying and, and when I finished I put the harmonica back in my pocket and I turned to go and as I did I heard one of them say he said I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years and I've never seen nothing like this <laughs> Come on, you got it, Caleb. <laughs> Nothing about that was a joke, all right? The only thing true about that joke was the, the chicken traffic up, up here on Goodman Road. <laughs> I, I thought we needed to lighten up here a bit, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We are the chicken capital of the Mid-South here on Goodman Road. We got five or six chicken places, and, and all of them are doing good business. It makes me upset that the chicken place is backed up all the way down Goodman Road, and, and we got plenty of parking spaces out here at the church. What the world? I, I thought to myself, we need to serve chicken in, on Sundays. <laughs> So any of you ladies that want to cook up some fried chicken, bring it on. Amen. We'll turn to Psalms chapter 1. Are you better now? Scarred for life. The pastor told me a story. Well, Psalms chapter 1, uh, of course, that's the beginning of Psalms. We're going to go right to the beginning. Verse 1. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. You're not standing around joining in and following the advice of the wicked. You're not being, in other words, you're not participating in what the world is doing right now. Oh, the joys of those who don't act a fool. Is basically what it's saying. It says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. In other words, they're reading their Bible. And not just reading it to see how much they can finish, but reading it to get something, meditating on it. And thus they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves no, never wither. And they prosper in all they do. You know, all you have to do is take a look around and people are overwhelmed and they're fearful. And they're desperate. They're mad. They don't know why. Well, they got a thousand reasons why. They're deceived. People are at their boiling point. And that's just here in the church. People are lashing out, they're acting out, and some of them are checking out. 
These are troubled times in which we live. And my message today is that we must contrast, contrast the hopelessness. Say contrast. contrast. That's the word the Lord gave me this week. Contrast. I looked it up in the dictionary. It says the state of being strikingly different from something else. Are you strikingly different from the world? Do they have to ask you, are you a Christian? Because if you have contrast in your life, you're strikingly different from something else. Uh, did you ever get those pictures loaded? I know we had computer problems again today. Now, our overheads, you know, these things don't zoom in the way I really hope they would. But I want to show you some pictures. Could you show that first picture? That's the original picture. I took that a couple of days ago, and you may have saw it posted on Facebook. I said, beauty for your soul. Remember, we talked about having beauty for your soul recently. You can't really even see it in the picture, but the reason I took it, there's a, there's a rainbow in that white cloud there that goes across the sky. That's a, a nice picture. Could you show the second picture? Okay, you can see it better on that one. I decreased the contrast on the picture. Now you can't see the rainbow at all. I mean, I don't care how hard you squint. It's just the picture is washed out. Say washed out. Washed out. Without contrast, things get washed out and everything begins to look the same. But in the third picture, Miss, Miss Kirsty, I added contrast to the picture. And on this side, you can actually see the rainbow. Can you see it? Do you see how things stand out? They're strikingly different from something else. Say contrast. <laughs> what the world needs is for the Christians to provide some contrast. So I talk to, I'm going to talk about seven things that should be a contrast between a Christian's life and the world right now. So how, we're going to talk about how to provide that. You ready? The first thing is we have hope. We're not like those without hope in the world. They're looking for hope. We've got the hope. Hebrews 6.19 says this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. We're not being blown and tossed around by every wind and wave of doctrine and, and they're searching for the answer and the truth. We have the truth. We're anchored to it and His name is Jesus. We know the truth. It has set us free. Our feet are planted on solid ground. We have the hope in this world. Peter says it, it makes us different. He calls us peculiar people. Pastor, I don't want to be called peculiar. You can't help it. You were made one of a kind. You weren't made to fit in and wash out. You were made to contrast. You were made to bring the rainbow into the picture. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You are the Elijah. Remember last week? Right. You're meant to stand out. That brings me to my second contrast. And it is courage. Christians have courage. We display courage instead of fear. We have hope and we bring the courage. We're not afraid to stand alone and say contrast. Like Elijah last week. There were 950 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And Elijah felt like he was all alone. He felt like he was the only one in all of Israel serving God. It didn't matter to him. He was going to stand up. He was going to declare boldly with courage that the Lord is God to serve him. And he called down fire. And guess what? If you'll stand up, God will answer by fire. You are never alone. You and God are a majority. And God will help you answer by fire. Our first allegiance is to Almighty God. We have courage. I think about Daniel, the prophet. Daniel was a, a boy, probably a teenager, 
the Babylonians conquered Israel, took, killed most of the people, but they took some of them off, and they took the best looking and the brightest, and Daniel happened to be one of them. You might, might remember Shadrach and Benny. What about Shad? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They called them Shadrach and Benny, huh? for short. Rack, Shack, and Benny. Okay. Those three were with Daniel. So they took four Hebrew boys. They began to train them to learn the, the Babylonian language, whatever that was, the language of the Chaldeans, or whatever they say. And they were training them to, to work in the king's court. Well, they started to train Daniel, and, they, and Daniel was okay with them changing his name to Belshazzar or something. Now, he was okay with the training. He was okay with learning something new. But they were trying to get him to eat the king's food. And that wasn't kosher with Daniel, so to speak. It wasn't God's dietary plan that he had given the Jews. So Daniel said, I'm not eating. He didn't say it. At first, he didn't say it rudely. He just went to his handler and he says, do you mind if uh, I don't drink the king's wine and eat the king's food and I just drink water and eat vegetables? And the guy was like, I can't have that. You'll get all skinny and out of shape and the king will say, what, you ain't doing a good job? He'll have me killed. He said, no, just give us 10 days. See what happens. After 10 days, those four Hebrew boys were, it says they were fatter than the rest of them. And when God means fatter, he means healthier. They were, they were showing uh, that, that God's food is better than the king's food. And so Daniel proved himself. He set himself apart by not going with the world's plan. And he rose in power in, in the Babylonian Empire by doing so. There was another time where uh, that was Nebuchadnezzar was king, and then there was a king called Darius that took over after that. He said, uh, his handlers told him, let's make a rule that nobody can pray unless they pray to you. Well, how do you think that went over with Daniel? What if our government came and said, there'll be no more praying to this Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There'll be no more praying to the Christian God. You're going to pray to the president, or you're going to pray to whatever they determine. What do you think Daniel said? No way, Jose. He opened his window, he bowed down, and he prayed to his God just like he always did. Well, guess what happened? people from the world that was jealous of Daniel's rank and authority and, and how he, he carried himself, conducted himself, and the contrast that he provided for the king. They got all jealous and they went and ratted on him. Told the king, Daniel's not bound down. I wonder how long it'll be before people be ratting us out for being Christians. Ratting us out for not following along with the world's plan. Anyway, Darius said, he was, he was upset. King Darius was upset because Daniel was his favorite. He knew Daniel was a blessing to him. He said, Daniel, why'd you do this? I done made a decree. If you don't, I'm going to have to throw you in a lion's den. Daniel, I hope your God can save you. And he choked him in the lion's den. Well, Daniel stayed in there with them hungry lions all night. The next day, King Darius came and said, Daniel... I hope you're in there. I hope God listened because the king prayed for Daniel. And Daniel said, have no fear, my Lord. My God answered and shut the mouth of the lions. You stand apart for Jesus. He will cover you. He will answer by fire. He'll shut the mouth of the lions. He'll, he'll cause you to rise. Your contrast is meant to make you rise. Your fitting in washes you out. We were made to add contrast to this world. And if you don't be who God called you to be, you won't be it. You won't see it. We need courage not to fit in in today's society. <laughs> Especially when the crowd's going the wrong way. We're living for an audience of one, right? We're not concerned about cancel culture. 
Let them counsel us. Let them say that we're not politically correct and shun us. We don't care. We're not serving you. We're serving him. We don't care what they say. That's the problem. We done got so close and so compromised that we begin to care what they say. Am I preaching hard again? Every week I come in here and say, we're going to tell a joke this week. We're going to lighten it up. Yeah, way to go, guy. <laughs> but it reminds me of the two kings. Saul, the first king of Israel. And how he stood out and that he was tall and he was good looking and he had everything on the outside. But on the inside, he was a blabbering little compromiser, a, a people pleaser. He really only cared what the people, God would tell him what to do and he'd do some of it. But he cared more about what the people said than what God said. That's where we have a lot of people today. They care more about what the world says than what God says. David came in there. He didn't care what the world says. He danced himself naked before the ark. He said, I'll be, I'll be more undignified than this. You wait and see. Whatever God asks me to do, I'll do. He didn't care. It wasn't about him. It was about him. See, the Bible says we through all our lifetime are in in bondage to the fear of man. We care what people think. You want to be free? Start caring what God thinks. And don't worry about what everybody else thinks. That's why I ain't afraid to stand up here and it's quiet. God's doing a work in me. I'm not here to please you even. What well, does it? You're out of here, Pastor. <laughs> I don't care. God will put me somewhere else. Amen. I do care because I love you. I'm on fire with you. Thank you, ma'am. Are you willing to dance undignified for the Lord? <laughs> so we need courage. We got hope. The third contrast, of course, is love. Jesus said, you shall be known by your love one for another. That's how we're supposed to be known. You say, well, he said one for another. He didn't say we had to lo love, the Lord, uh, love the world. We just love each other. Well, just start there. That would be, be a good advancement. Just start loving one another, and maybe it will work its way out. But God so loved the world. He loves everybody. <laughs> so, hey. But we shall be known. That's, I mean, they should look at us and just feel the love. Really. You know, there was a woman caught in the act of adultery that was thrown at the feet of Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, they had their stones in their hands saying, Give us the word, Master, we to put the hurt on this lady. That's what the law says. That's what she deserves. Go ahead and give us the okay, we're going to knock her out. She's a sinner. She don't deserve mercy. Jesus said, hold, hold, hold now. He started writing in the dust. I don't know what he was writing, but maybe it was the sins of the people that was talking that foolishness. And he jumps up and says, let me tell you what. Let he without sin cast the first stone. They went, oh, boy, that guy tells the truth. dropped the stones and they walked off. But look at the heart. Look at the contrast between the pharisaical heart and Jesus' heart. A stark contrast. They just wanted, they wanted to hate the sin and the sinner. And Jesus just hates the sin, but he wants to redeem the sinner. Amen. And I know you know John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But do you know John 3, 17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, that's his heart. Okay, yeah, you're lost, dead in your sins and trespasses. We have all had a rock and we needed to drop it. But I came to save you. 
And that love is what makes people come to Christ. You're not going to shame them into coming to Christ. You're not going to argue them into coming to Christ. It's the love that is the power of God. He says, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. It wasn't a squishy type of love. It wasn't sloppy agape. He said, I, I'm not here to condemn you, but don't go sin no more. He's telling her the truth because he loves her. But the truth is, must be told in a way that convicts and not condemns. Convicts makes you want to do better. Condemnation wants to beat you down and say, I can't do better. I'm no good. So tell the truth. Yes. But do it in love. Do it in love. Do it in a way that convicts and not Condemns. Kenetra Bryant says, God love, God's love forgives. It covers, protects, it provides and heals, it restores, it reveals, rewards, it establishes and demonstrates his continued grace, his mercy and power in our lives. God's love is the power of God. It is meant to be a blessing in our life, both coming and going. But the problem is, is we're all too ready to receive God's love, but we're all too unwilling to give God's love. We want it, but we don't want to give it. But that's, you're missing the power of God in your life if you don't share the love that God has given you. Am I making sense? Say contrast. Whew. Contrast number four. Faithfulness. In this faithless generation, if anybody in here owns their own business and trying to keep employees to get to work on time today? <laughs> wow. We're living in a faithless generation. And when we compromise and become like them, it's not a good look as a Christian. We're not supposed to lower ourselves to their expectations. We're supposed to set the bar in Christ. He sets the bar in perfection. And he expects us to struggle with the difference between where we are and where we need to be. And we must not compromise as Christians. That Shaq, Rack and Vinny, what they call? Rack, Shaq, and Vinny? You say it in a certain order? Okay, those three Hebrew boys, right? Well, that King Nebuchadnezzar set up a golden statue to himself. And then what the politicians to do today? They set up golden statues to themselves, expect us to worship them. He said, anybody, when you hear the music, you got to bow down and you got to worship my statue. Well, when the music started playing, you could look across the land, everybody was bowed down, except for three people, Shaq, Rack, and Benny. They were still standing, refused to bow. Refuse to kneel to the gods of this world. Well, this angered the king. Nebuchadnezzar called him in. Well, he was already hot on the collar. I saw you guys didn't bow to my statue. Maybe you didn't hear the music. I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. This is, I'm just supposing here. <laughs> Are you going to bow to my statue? They said, no. He said, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. They said, oh, king, if you throw us into the fiery furnace, we believe that our God will deliver us. We've seen what he did for Daniel. We've seen what he did for Elijah. 
We believe that our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we will still not bow down to your statue. They want us to bow down to their statutes today, don't they? Lord, help us, Jesus. So he, he stoked that fire seven times hotter than was normal. And he had his best guards go to throw Shaq, Rack, and Biddy in the fire. It was so hot that the guards melted. They melted. Shaq, Rack, and Biddy are walking around in the fire. Walking around in the fire, and the king looks in there and says, I see three we sit in there, but there's a fourth one. Looks like the Son of God in there with them. I'm telling you, your God will answer by fire, or he'll get in the fire. One or the other. He called them out, and they came out, and they weren't even smelling like smoke. <laughs> Our God will answer. Our God is looking for someone who will stand apart, stand alone, stand in contrast to this world. And you are him, Elijah. We have an obligation also not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. As is the matter of some, Hebrews 10.25 says. That means you uh, live stream or here in live service, we're living in times that we need to show the world that church is important. Can I get an amen? amen? This is not something, this is not a social club. This is important. This is vital to our society. Amen. Crucial, in fact. It's what Jesus is doing on the earth. If we abandon the church, we abandon what Jesus is doing on the earth. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together and spreading the gospel and making disciples is not COVID contingent. Amen. Our obligation did not stop when the coronavirus appeared. The devil wants to stop us. He wants to stifle us. He wants us to say, well, church isn't vital. Church isn't important. Let's, in fact, let's not even do church. Yeah, he would love for that to happen. It's not happening on my watch. It's not happening on your watch, Elijah. You still have a responsibility to win the lost souls in your realm of influence. And God is willing to give you a bigger realm of influence if you'll listen to him. And you'll seek him. The day is coming that we're going to have to face our own lions. I'm figuratively speaking right now, but really, in not too long, it may be literal. Amen. Amen. We've been saying it's going to happen. Nobody ever believes you when you tell them. But persecution is coming to the church. Yes. Peter and the disciples, they were told by the Pharisees, the same people that crucified Jesus, we don't want you preaching in Jesus' name and in Acts chapter 29, he said we ought to obey God rather than men. He just told them straight up. I'm not saying don't comply with your local officials and all these things. I'm not saying that. As much as was, is reasonable, but we serve a higher authority and his name is Jesus Christ and it's not COVID contingent. We ought to obey God rather than men. Be faithful. The fifth contrast is holiness. Holy means set apart for God and His purpose. That just means contrast, doesn't it? Say contrast. contrast. It means set apart for God and His purpose. And I would add in behavior and in proximity. And the way you behave, you need to behave like Christ, but the only way you're going to behave like Christ is if you're walking with Christ in proximity to Him. That's where holiness comes from. Moses was the only one that would go up the mountain to be with God. All the people was, you go for us, Moses. 
The pastor can't be holy for you. You have to have your own relation with Jesus Christ. Joshua, his right-hand man, the young boy that he was training up, discipleship at work, caught the fire. And in Exodus 33, 11, it says, Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And afterwards, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. Joshua didn't get enough. Joshua caught fire. He, he, he recognized the presence of the Lord, and even Moses would get up and go his way after he spoke to God. And, and I don't know if God was still there, or Joshua just wanted to be where God had been, but he would stay in the meet, tent of meeting longer than Moses. How bad do you want Jesus? Joshua was the one who was able to bring them across into the promised land. It was because he sought after God. He was a man after God. How bad do you want it? Is holiness important to you? The sixth contrast, we have the Spirit of God. The world doesn't have that. <laughs> Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I don't think I've seen the world in any of those so far. Gentleness. Certainly no self-control. Against such there is no law. Why do we need a law? Because of the ungodly. We don't need a law for the godly. The law is for lawbreakers. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. And its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. This whole earth, man, everywhere we see the Spirit of Antichrist and the earth is groaning. Will the redeemed of the Lord please stand up? We need contrast. We're being washed out here. Where's the contrast? And contrast number seven, nothing is more stark than light in the dark. You have the light of life. Jesus said, whoever follows me will never have darkness, but will have the light of life. You have the light which leads to life. It's never been easier to stand out in our generation. Some of you say, well, it ain't easy like it was back in the day of so-and-so or whatever being a Christian. No. You were called for such a time as this. You were called for the darkest hour so that you could shine the brightest. It's never been easier to stand out. All you have to do is the basic things and you shine like a bulb, like a lighthouse. We have the light of life. So let me recap and I'm going to close. The seven things that I mentioned, Christians need to contrast and of course there's a lot of others. We have hope. We have courage, we have love, we have faithfulness, and we have holiness, the Spirit of God, and the light of life. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness at our disposal. All the promises of God are yes and amen. All we have to do is be man or woman enough to stand up in them. <laughs> you know, a lot of times somebody will die. Somebody in the congregation knows or somebody... Somebody I know, and they may ask me, do you think they went to heaven? I was wondering, do you think they went to heaven? I don't know. Now's not the time to be thinking about it. You should have thought about that on the other end. When you boil down our life as Christians, the reason we're not zapped up to heaven the moment we get saved is we're down here to win souls, to bring light in the midst of this darkness, the light of life into the dark. People dead in their sins and trespasses. We're here. We're saved with a holy calling. We're ambassadors for Christ. We've got to rise in this hour. We've got to shine. We've got to contrast the light and the darkness. If America is washed out, it's because Christians have failed to provide the contrast. Now, I'm not 
know we've gone long today. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to speak to anybody here that doesn't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to introduce you to the light. I want to bring you, I want God to bring you out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son where there's light and life and, and happiness and hope and truth and, and courage and all these things we've talked about today. My brother and sister, pray for those lost listening right now. If you don't know that you have a home in heaven, you don't know that if you died right now that you would be in the presence of God, Maybe you're concerned that you would spend eternity in hell. If you don't know, then the answer is yes, you would. Because you may know that you have eternal life if Christ is Lord of your life. He sends his spirit in there and you know that you know. Now if you're questioning that right now, the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. He's calling you. He's gentle. He wants to show you. How, how his love works. He doesn't hate you. He's not mad at you. He wants you to repent and be saved. That, that the world through him might be saved. And what he requires is you to say with your mouth that he is your Lord. That you turn from your sinful life and you give your heart to him and that you believe he is who he says he is because he raised from the dead. It's not hard. But it's the biggest decision that you'll have to make in this life. And if you fail to make this decision, you're washed out for eternity, my friend. So if you don't know Jesus as the Lord of your life, pray with me. Say it out loud so that God can hear. That's, what, that's the thing he longs to hear. Since you were born, this is the day, this is the hour of your salvation. This is the moment that he has waited for. And he is saying, Say with me, God, I repent of my sins and make Jesus Lord of my life. I believe that you died on my cross, that you were raised to life. And I ask you to raise me to this everlasting life that I may be the contrast this world needs. That my life will count. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.